I just want to say what an honor it has been to be a co-mentor with Chad Lane. Um, it's really fun to work with Chad if you don't already know that. Um, but, but a real privilege um, to mentor Destiny Johnson, whom I got to know along with our other two capstone um, students in, in a course last year. I have to say that all of this, this is true for all of them, but um, I know more about Destiny than the other two. So I will just say, Destiny, you are bright and um, engaged and you have a passion for what you do. So it's really, I think we're all going to have a good time listening to what you have to say. So, um, and I do know where, I, I just asked her, she is going to go on to George Washington University next year, master's program in museum studies, which is, yeah, go ahead and clap. Because as you will be able to tell from her presentation, this is what she was meant to do. So we are all lucky that she found us to as a sort of a throughway to her, her goal as a museum expert. So Chad, you want to say sure. something? Sure. So it's either a good thing or a bad thing. I'll let Destiny decide. But somehow, she ended up with two advisors. And Kyle ended up advising two <laughs> capstone projects. So I don't know how that worked out. But it's, uh, it was a lot of fun working with you this year, Destiny. When I first arrived at U of I, it didn't take long for Destiny to find me and ask about uh, the work I was doing in museums. Uh, and then she signed up for my class in informal learning. And so that's where our work together started. She also volunteered to support a new uh, museum in Champaign-Urbana called the Spark Museum, which is opening uh, a small version of its opening in Lincoln Square. So that's pretty exciting stuff. And Destiny was involved in the early brainstorming for that with me. So we had a lot of fun. Uh, so but just I will just add on what Michelle said. It, it's uh, really fun to to work with you, to see your passion in action and all of the work that you did in, in uh, the Cranard Art Museum that we're going to learn about. I'm very excited by it. I'll end real quick. Uh, Destiny's name is very interesting. Her father wanted to name her Destiny, but with a Y. Uh, her mom's is, name is Renee. It ends with two E's, and so that was the compromise. So Destiny, uh, we're very much looking forward to your talk. <laughs> well, thank you guys for your remarks. It's been a pleasure working with the both of you as well. Um, I really appreciate the bond that we've grown um, over the two years. So thank you guys for everything, really. All right, so on to my project. So the title of my uh, capstone is The Effect of Teacher Involvement on the Student Field Trip Experience. All right, so I'm Destiny Johnson. I'm a senior in the LES major, Learning Education Studies, with a concentration in Applied Learning Sciences. My goal is to best understand ways to support student learning in field trip environments, um, specifically museums. <coughs> Excuse me. I worked at Chicago Children's Museum for three years um, as a play and learning facilitator. And what that means is that, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> what that means is that I've been able to facilitate different programs and learning for our visitors. Um, I've done research with them on the importance of STEM in museum environments, and that inspired me to look forward and uh, look at museums here in Craner at Craner. So we're talking about, I'm sorry, I'm really nervous. <laughs> <coughs> so there's a lot of literature. Um, can I talk without the mic? I want to talk with the mic. Need the mic. Need the mic. All right. It's a lot of pressure. Um, so, thanks. <laughs> All right, so like I said, um, really interest, interested in museums, the way that kids are learning in museums, and the way that they get things out of their experience. So what inspired me to do this uh, specific research project is, you know, kids go to, go to school every day. And they're learning a lot of different things. They go to museums, and that's usually like a one-time experience that they have. So one thing that I wanted to know is whether or not the museum experiences that they have can transfer over to what they're learning in the classroom, as well as whether the classroom experiences that they have can transfer over into their museums, <coughs> field trip experiences. So a um, lot of literature. Perry 2012 and Lionheart Crowley, they talk about conversation in museums. Uh, we're going to talk about today how the teachers are going to influence how how the teachers are going to influence um, the learning in museums. Who 
Ooh. All right, so what I did was observe three middle school classrooms at the Craner Art Museum. Um, the program that is facilitated at the Craner is called CAMWAM, which is, stands for Craner Art Museum's Week at the Museum. So students, uh, excuse me, um, <laughs> I'm so nervous. Okay. <laughs> So um, three classrooms came to Craner, and what they do is they facilitate different activities across the week. So students get to spend a lot of time in the exhibits, learning different things. And what's unique about this um, experience is that the teachers are teaching them whatever content um, that, that is being learned, as well as um, different museum educators throughout the week are supporting the teachers in these learning experiences. All right, so we're going to talk about what I did in my methods. So, prior to arrival, we had the parents complete some consent forms, and then the students completed, after the, they completed the consent forms, the students completed a questionnaire about their interest in museums. So, this, it has six questions on it, basically inquiring whether or not students um, like to look at art, they talked about um, what their experiences were with art museums, whether or not they've attended an art museum before, whether or not they've attended Cranard whether or not they um, enjoy completing art projects, et cetera. So from these surveys that I had the students complete, six students were randomly selected um, for a target group. So this is a case study as well as um, a regular study. So those who do not submit the consent forms were not analyzed, of course. Um, so during their week at Cranert, um, the target students' groups, I observed them as they walked across and, you know, enjoyed their time in the exhibits over five days. So no, the target students, of course, did not know that they were being observed, so I just kind of followed everybody around. So that was five groups that I um, looked at. Um, then the target students were interviewed at the end of the week about their overall experience and the influence of the adults in their field trip. And then, after their wonderful week at Craner, uh, the students were given a post-field trip survey that is kind of similar to their pre-trip survey, and then the pre-trip and the post-trip um, surveys were analyzed and compared. All right, any questions so far? Am I going too fast? No? All right, great. So, of the 75 students that attended the trip, 35 students completed the, the informed consent and the pre-trip surveys, and then 25 students completed the informed consent and the post-trip surveys. So now we're going to look at what the kids were saying um, on the different surveys. So like I said, one of the first questions on the pre-trip and the post-trip surveys were, quote unquote, do you like to look at art? So we're gonna, I'm going to explain what the graphs mean. So A was, I did it where it was like emojis for the kids. So the A was the smiley face, the B was like the thinking face. And the C was like a, a mad face. So <laughs> the kids really enjoyed that. So um, as you see, for the pre-trip survey, which is that one, um, they were saying that 69.7% said that they do like to look at art. 24.2% um, said that they not really sure whether or not they like to look at art. And that was just a very small percent. It was probably like two kids that said they didn't like to look at art of the um, selected. Then after the, after the field trip, they said 76%, so it went up, 76% said that they did like to look at art, 20% said that they, uh, they still aren't sure, and then again, like one or two students said that they did not like to look at art after the field trip. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, so another important question on the pre and post trip surveys <clears throat> were, what do you think of art museums? So 64.7% said that um, they liked art museums. 34 point, I'm sorry, 32.4% said that, you know, they aren't really sure. And then, like I said, one or two students said that they did not like art museums. And then after the week at the museum, 91.3% said that they did enjoy their museum experience and they liked art museums. And then, um, again, very small percentages said that they didn't really like the experience or they weren't really sure after they were finished. Um, another important thing that I um, inquired was who helped you with their art with your art projects. Now, of course, I, I inquired these things during the post trip survey, um, and I'll show you guys what those surveys and look like at the end. But um, yeah, so 
I asked them who helped them with most of their projects, and what was said was that museum educators were the primary helpers of, you know, with the, with the kids of the project. So 48%, pretty much 50. A teacher at their school, 28%, and other students <coughs> um, had 16% of who helped the students with their art projects. And um, the last question that I thought was really important to assess was which one was their favorite art exhibit and why? So the WPA Feelings Gallery. So I'm going to explain what that means. So the WPA Gallery was a gallery in Craner. They just moved it, actually. And these are two pieces that were there. Um, is a gallery from the Great Depression. And uh, the government, they funded art projects. And Craner took some of those things and put it in the museum. Great. So um, <laughs> what the activity was, the students w came into the, the gallery, and they walked around, and they looked at the different arts that was on the wall. After they looked at the art, the teacher who was facilitating the activity, he came in and he said, um, so what do you feel about you know, what you saw? A lot of kids didn't know. They said, I don't know. This is just paint on you know, canvas. It's just not anything really significant. So the teacher, oops. <laughs> ah. So the teacher, he um, went on and explained to them that it's important to think about different feelings when you're looking at different art. Um, so another thing that they'd done after they discussed that, he had them listen to a song. So as they were listening to a song, he asked the kids, you know, what emotions are depicted in the song? So after that, all the kids, I think it was, uh, we'll say, a uh, Louis Armstrong song. And a lot of kids were saying, oh, you know, happy and sad. And the point of that activity was to explain that, excuse me, the point of the activity was to explain that there, there can be multiple um, emotions in different pieces of art. So <clears throat> some of the kids, after they went back, they looked at this piece and they said, oh, OK, this guy looks kind of sad, or this guy looks like he's really into it. So they were explaining how there can be multiple emotions in art. And then after that, they had an activity where they had to make their own scene after listening to a song. Does that make sense? Anybody ever got it? They have um, had to listen to a song and uh, depict different scenes. So this here is kind of what the kids made. So the teacher had picked the song, and uh, the kids created a background. Whatever, they picked a, a background, they drew a background, and a lot of the songs that he picked had different ups and downs of, you know, different emotions throughout the song. So a lot of the kids drew, like, half scenes where there was a sad part with rain or then another with the rainbow. And then they had to imagine themselves in the song, so that's what those hanging um, figures are right there. So a lot of kids like that. A lot of kids were saying that um, they really enjoyed learning about how there can be multiple feelings in a song and, you know, how you can really express yourself through arts in multiple ways. All right, so the last portion that I will talk about is the interviews from the Target students. So these are just some kind of fun ones that I thought were kind of interesting. So one of the questions that I asked was, did you learn anything from your week at Craner? And then target student number three said, I learned that you can really express multiple feelings through art, which I kind of touched on just a few seconds ago. Um, a lot of kids really, really like that activity. Whoops. Another question is, how did you feel after learning you were going to spend a week in an art museum? Um, target student five said, I was excited, but I didn't know what to expect. So a lot of kids. It's a week in a museum. Kids, you know, of course, they're usually used to going on a field trip from, we'll say, like a few hours of their day, not really coming back day after day after day. And a lot of kids were saying that, you know, they didn't know what to expect because they have never done anything like that before. So, you know, after the week went on, as I, you know, I'm analyzing the interviews, they were saying that they did become more comfortable um, throughout their week and they did begin to have more fun with the different activities that. Um, were aligned with their interests. All right, so the last one, <laughs> uh, target student number three also said, I asked her, uh, would you bring your family and friends to Craner? And she said, duh, of course I would, which I cracked up when she said that. <laughs> so I think that they really did have a good time. Um, a lot of them learned a lot. 
a lot of them talked to me. I was supposed to kind of just be in the background and just like, you know, observe. But they were like, yeah, help me color this. Or, you know, let me tell you about, you know, why I like this piece of art and things like that. So the kids were really engaged throughout the entire week. And I really enjoyed, um, you know, observing them throughout the week and, you know, getting to know them as individuals and as a group. So. <laughs> All right, thank you. <laughs> All right, firstly, any questions? <laughs> Go for it. Uh, what surprised you uh, at any point in the project? What surprised me? So I'll talk about my target kids. So a lot of my target kids, which of course they were randomly selected, so I didn't know what to expect from them, but like they were full of energy and very, not that I expected them to not be intelligent or engaged, but they were really engaged with, you know, the material that, you know, they were being presented with. Some things that, of course, throughout the week, um, I had been introduced to that I was just totally like, ah, eh, they're not going to like this. Um, also, what surprised me was, <laughs> How they were, how the target kids were acting throughout, I guess, throughout their week compared to what they said in their interviews. So, like, some of the target kids throughout the week I watched and they were like totally engaged, in my opinion, with the material. They really were talking to their friends and the teachers and things like that. But when I asked them, like, oh, what did you learn or how did you enjoy yourself? They were kind of like, eh, I didn't really like it that much. So, I mean, the the balance between the two was kind of interesting to see, but it could have been just a different effect because I was actually directly asking them the questions as a, a researcher, you know. Yeah. And they're real smooth. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. Anybody else? Did they, I should know this, but I'm going to ask him. Did, in the interviews, did they talk about the teacher influence on them at all? Um, some of them did. Some of them didn't have much to mention, but most, most of the students um, really associated their favorite activities which, with specific teachers um, in the, well, let me show you guys. Sorry. <laughs> in the post uh, survey um, from question four, I inquired, you know, who helped them the most? And um, also with number three, I, I was specified like how teachers at their school um, help them with their projects or, you know, throughout the week. So, um, you know, in their interviews, they don't really say much about it, but in their forms, it's expressed here. So like I said, um, a teacher at my school helped us with new things we saw, uh, we learned about art, gave us direction uh, for new activities, helped us complete activities, asked us a lot of questions. Um, about the art that we saw or did not teach us anything or um, worked with the teachers at Craner to help us learn about art. So it's a kind of a range and a lot of the students were very helpful in helping me understand, you know, the teacher's role in the, their art projects. I, I thought it was interesting when you told me that they treated their own teachers differently than the staff at the museum because it's like your family, right? You have a mm -hmm. relationship with the teacher. That's kind of cool. Yeah. Yeah. Any other questions? Oh. Um, just art all week long, or was it integrated with history or with oh. other subjects? OK, so I can talk. I guess I didn't really touch on that. So at Craner, it's you know, mostly art. But with art, there is history, of course. So um, throughout the week, I think they um, interacted with, I think, 15 activities or exhibits. Some of them, like, will say, like, ancient Peru or uh, WPA, because they did talk about the Great Depression during it, or um, hmm, ancient Egypt. And they did some things with uh, ancient Mediterranean and ancient Greece, where they were actually, you know, being quizzed or, like, um, asked about different things throughout history that they were familiar with or unfamiliar with mm -hmm. and being taught at the same time through different activities. So, yeah, it was art and history all in one. Or, yeah, all in one. Go for it. <laughs> yes? I have uh, two daughters, and they like to create art, but they hate art museums. Mm -hmm. Now, what's your... 
Well, um, depending on the grade, you can send them to um, Ann at Cranert because <laughs> there's a lot of cool stuff going on there. Like, um, art, they hate art museums. So, like, um, Ann has a lot of cool stuff going on there at Cranert. So, they have kids at Cranert. Have you ever, anybody heard of that? Kids at Cranert? Where um, there's an event on like a Saturday in the fall and the kids are able to interact with the art exhibits as well as like do activities uh, put on by the class that I'm in. <laughs> um, and you know, it's just kind of cool that the kids are able to see art in a different way and kind of make their own things. Um, and then, like I said, they have um, different activities at Cranert that um, are facilitated through schools. So there's the week at the mu museum, Cam Lamb, and then they have Cam Bam, which is a day at the museum for like field trips. So yeah, if you're interested, you know, tell your kids' teachers to, you know, come to Craner. <laughs> yes. I'm, I'm, I'm curious. As, this is a question for all three. Yeah. Um, are you? I'm curious about whether there was doing doing the project, not the findings, but doing the project. Was there something that, that really surprised you? Doing the project. Yeah. Like actually facilitating research. Yeah. In terms of the kind of experience and. Your own project? Um, I think I was very surprised at what I was capable of as far as like how deep my inquiries went with this. This is just like kind of a snippet because of course it's just a 10 minute um, presentation but um, you know I really wanted to understand um, after I you know collected the data I really wanted to understand um, how the teachers, whether or not the teachers um, influenced the way that the kids thought about certain activities that they specifically, um, I'm sorry, different activities that the teachers specifically facilitated. Then I wanted to know like whether or not kids who were in classes, because it was a mix, it was a mixed group. So whether or not kids who were in groups with their own classmates affected who, which um, activities they liked best or like, you know, whether or not um, students were completely indulged or, you know, indulged in the activities because of the people who, that they were around or because of the specific teacher or because they did not like a specific teacher. So, you know, the possibilities were endless. And as I was sitting here trying to analyze all of this data, <laughs> it was just really, like, interesting. Like, wow, I really did this. And this is, like, a lot of good things can come from it. So, yeah, that's what really surprised me. Yeah. Anyone else? Yes. You had a couple of kids at the beginning, the very first survey, that did not want anything to do with the museum. And then at the end, you still had a couple of kids. Were those the same kids, I'm wondering? Um, sometimes they were. I think of the, that data, um, one of them was, because it was only two kids, <laughs> one of them was, and the other one um, advanced to the I don't know phase. <laughs> so, you know, there is there has been improvement. So, yeah. Yeah. Anyone else? Keep them coming. I like answering questions more than I like presenting. <laughs> uh, so I'm Jennifer Cromley, and it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Jeremy Davis. And Jeremy actually started in the college as an elementary ed major and uh, chose the Apples uh, program and took a uh, research methods course with me. And uh, the major goal of that course is to finish up with a fully designed study. And um, it's always exciting to see, you know, how do the studies actually turn out and how do they change. And whenever we work with doctoral students, of course, they always change a lot. So it was exciting to work with Destiny and to see hers uh, evolve. And Kelly, I can't wait to see yours. And um, but uh, Jeremy came in, and this this was his idea, and he really pursued it. And uh, you know, it's just it's just a great pleasure to work with somebody who's. Um, as, as enthusiastic about running as I am. Yes. <laughs> and uh, so Jeremy is going to tell us um, about his study, about the results, and also um, what's happening next after uh, commencement on the 13th. Yeah. So, Jeremy, it's Thank all yours. Okay. Hi, everybody. My name is Jeremy Davis. And as Jennifer so kindly mentioned, I am a senior in the Apples program. And I'm going to be talking to you today about the research that I conducted entitled Motivation for Learning a Foreign Language Between Different College Departments. So kind of a brief overview of this research. Um, 
Motivate, as we all know, as students and as educators, we all know that motivation plays a large role in a lot of the decisions that are made every single day as students. Um, whether that's finding which major you're gonna do, um, which direction you wanna head in for a career, uh, there's a lot of underlying motivational factors that go into uh, decisions. And kind of taking that a step further, what I wanted to look at um, was motivation to learn foreign languages. Um, so going along with that, there are, of course, many different reasons as to why students would learn a foreign language here on campus. So breaking that down into two different categories, there are two main types of motivation that students uh, students experience. One of them is extrinsic motivation and the other one is intrinsic motivation. So a little overview about both of those. So extrinsic motivation is where um, something outside of yourself is motivating you to learn something. So whether that's grades or whether that is money, um, something outside of yourself is motivating you. Um, thinking back to intrinsic motivation, um, intrinsic motivation is where um, you are doing it for the for bettering yourself and for something or to improve something within yourself by learning this. So thinking about this and thinking about how I could research this, um, the research question that I came up with, and you could probably guess what it is. So how do college students' motivations to learn a foreign language differ between colleges and majors? Um, so taking that a step further then, uh, the hypothesis was um, that I thought students' motivations to learn a foreign language will in fact differ depending on what, uh, what they are studying here. So um, the participants uh, that were included in this research included 100 undergraduate and graduate students aged 18 to 24. And we also got just one 31-year-old snuck in there, so it was kind of funny. Um, but then from those 100 participants, we broke them down into their colleges. And a little side note about that, um, we actually only had nine College of Business students at first. And to make it a little bit more uh, statistically sound, we decided to compare that uh, or to combine that with um, a category other. There was an option uh, to put that in, in the survey, so we decided to combine those. Um, so there were 25, 24 business and other students, there were 39 LAS students, and also 37 education students. Um, and breaking that down into gender, you can see that the females heavily outweigh the males who participated in this. There were 26 males and 74 females. Um, and just as kind of like a side note to this, I decided not to look at race and socioeconomic status just because um, I felt that it may distract a little bit from the pure intent of, of the research. So I, I wanted to look just at the motivation. So as you can see, this is, a kind of, this is kind of a breakdown of the different majors that were included in this research. So over here on the left-hand side, we have uh, the combination of business and other. Um, in the middle, we have education, and as you can see, the elementary education students are by far the majority of them. Um, and all the way to the right side, we have LAS uh, students. And over there, we can see that there is a wide variety of, uh, of different majors, which, I mean, as you all know, there's a wide variety of majors within the, co the college. So... <laughs> So talking about how this was actually measured, um, we actually used a survey that was developed in Canada at a French-English bilingual university um, by researchers by the names of Noels et al., which was created in 2000. Um, and basically what we did was we kind of adjusted a lot of the questions to um, better match what we wanted to look at here on campus. So. A lot of it had to do with eliminating questions, adding questions, um, to kind of get at the real intrinsic and extrinsic motivation factors within this data. Um, so from there, after creating the actual survey, we went in and uh, started recruiting, which by far was the most difficult part of this process, actually. 
um, what we did was we had uh, flyers posted in each of the college buildings that were being analyzed. Um, and also, we, uh, Dr. Christensen had undergraduate re researchers go out and hand out written surveys. Um, and also, we had, uh, there was another part, but I forgot it. Um, but from that point, we had um, data that was both available online through SurveyMonkey, and we transferred that into an Excel spreadsheet where I also went in manually and inputted the, the written scores. Um, so that was all compiled in, in Excel. And then I actually, just a few weeks ago, sat down with Dr. Cromley, and we, um, we thought that it would be a good idea to kind of get an introduction to a new statistical program, R, um, and that's pretty much where we did the majority of our uh, analyzation. So for the analysis, um, what we did was through R, we just uh, did a basic ANOVA that was uh, made to show that if there was a difference between the colleges. Um, and those were broken down into the, the raw scores, and those were also uh, then translated into Z scores to see if they still translated over. Um, and then, of course, we also use descriptive statistics to uh, compare the means. So let's kind of get into some of the numbers of it, of it all. So for the descriptive statistics for the means, this is kind of the breakdown of, uh, of how it works. So as just a side note before you start reading into this, um, the survey was uh, written in a way that one is actually strongly agreeing, so it's a positive. So all these low numbers, they're actually... Um, they're good. And all the higher numbers are actually bad. So as you can see, <laughs> the, um, the lowest one you'll see is uh, for intrinsic motivation for L the College of LAS. And I think um, one of the reasons that may be is because within the College of LAS, they have uh, students who are actually majoring in foreign languages. So of course, you'd imagine that they'd be more intrinsically motivated to, uh, to learn a language. Um, but I think some of the most interesting, uh, interesting findings within this is for education, they actually scored the highest in A motivation, which is pretty much the opposite of motivation. So that's me wanting to go into a foreign language uh, and you know I hate it, I want to quit right away. Um, so, so that's what I found interesting because as someone who was going to be an educator, um, until I actually switched majors, you know, I found myself to be incredibly intrinsically motivated to learn a language. Um, but, you know, maybe some of my peers don't feel that way. So, um, so yeah, so that was kind of interesting to see that. Really? Yeah. Standard deviations really identical for mm -hmm. all yeah, which, yeah, which I found really interesting. So, um, after sitting down with both Dr. Cromley and Dr. Christensen, um, the, this is the ANOVA that was conducted to show the, um, the significance between the colleges. So contrary to what my original hypothesis was, um, the significance is not high enough to be actually significantly uh, significant, I guess. Um, so the, the overall benchmark is uh, 0.05 for the p-value. And we found that none of them were actually significantly, uh, I guess, significant. <laughs> um, but I mean, going into this, and I'll talk about this a little later, it probably would have been more uh, statistically relevant if the, one, if the groups were equal, and two, if there were a lot more participants. So that would have uh, been a lot more telling in that regard. So kind of getting a little visual representation of this data, uh, in the upper, it's kind of cut off, in the upper left hand, uh, in the upper left hand corner, uh, you can see that, like I said, A motivation is lowest, which as you can see right here, one is strongly agree and seven is strongly disagree. Um, and I kind of explained the rationale behind that. Um, and then down here we have extrinsic motivation, um, which as you can see, the College of LAS is scoring the, lo the lowest in that category. 
And then in the upper right hand corner, we have LAS as well. Um, so I mean, this is pretty much what you would expect being that a motivation is opposite of what motivation really is. Um, so yeah, a little bit into the, into the numbers there. So kind of backtracking on what I've said about these results. Um, so like I said, there was absolutely uh, no significant difference between the colleges, contrary to what I had originally predicted by doing this research. Um, and I mean, as you can see, the, there are plenty of numerical differences between, between the colleges. Um, and I think it would have helped if there were a lot more participants and there were a lot and there was a lot more time to conduct this research. Um, but with that being said, um, I mean, LAS overwhelmingly had uh, the most intrinsic and extrinsic motivation. Uh, and surprisingly, the College of Education had the strongest A motivation. Um, and I mean, we could sit down and talk for days about why this was. Um, but I already kind of went into that. So. Um, so for the second portion of this, uh, this presentation, I just wanted to talk about where I might be heading in the, in the near future. So um, I'm currently still on the market. I have 24 active applications. Um, but I'm actually waking up early tomorrow to go back to Chicago for two final interviews that I have, both with um, Blue Cross Blue Shield downtown and the other one with a small investing uh, investment firm called Beacon Funding. Um, and those will be taking place on Thursday and Friday. So I'm very excited about those opportunities and hopefully they, one of them comes through. So, so yeah. So uh, to conclude this presentation, I'd just like to thank all of you for coming. Um, it's, been a, it's been a great pleasure being a part of this, uh, this very first graduating class within this Apples major. And it's been terrific to represent, uh, represent what has been done and what has been created. And I'd also like to expect, extend special thanks to Dr. Christensen for uh, his assistance throughout this whole process. It's been uh, a brand new experience for both of us. And I'd also like to thank, <laughs> um, I'd also like to thank Dr. Cromley for her uh, statistical expertise and her uh, help with the theoretical portion of this, this research. Um, so yeah, so thank you all for, for listening. So OK, yes, I will take questions. Kyle. Go, go back to your, your graphs. Yeah, yeah, please. Are you allowed to ask? <laughs> <laughs> I think I saw some people look confused on that, so I figured yeah. that's right. All right, so. So the so it, so the, the one in the in the upper left is the is the which that is a motivation which a is motivation. yes which is the opposite of motivation right. and the and the, the one in the upper right is the intrinsic motivation intrinsic motivation mm -hmm. and the bottom is the extrinsic end. correct okay. and your one two and three are the three different columns correct yes they're marked right there do you think it would be useful to look into the majors so there was like yeah like mm -hmm. econ and physics. Yes, that, that was definitely a consideration. That would have been a lot easier to do had we received like a thousand participants. Right. Um, but yeah, when you have one person in one major and one person in another, it's pretty hard to differentiate those two. So um, that was definitely taken into consideration. But yeah. But you might think about grouping majors mm -hmm. in terms of. Yeah, that, yeah that, that could, mm hmm. Yeah, that could definitely work. Mm hmm. Or if you plot as a cloud of dots and you split, for example, the one Ooh, okay. motivation or higher intrinsic motivation mm -hmm. and see which dots, like, graph as which major they come. Huh. Yeah, that would be very interesting. Huh. Okay. Yeah, Michelle. Yeah, so one of the other things that you seem to have um, found a, a larger number of to mm -hmm. do an analysis was gender. Mm -hmm. 74 yeah. Mm -hmm. and, uh, so 26 males, yeah. Three quarters women, one quarter men. Mm -hmm. and I'm just wondering if, did you, have you thought about doing some of the analyses based on gender rather than based on college? Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, that thought actually never occurred to me until just now. But yeah, that would be very interesting to see that. Um, I mean, as we all know as educators, I think major, 
majority in uh, the College of Education, we have mostly um, females. But um, yeah, that would be very interesting to see that. Do you have any hypotheses about why the, I mean, why College of Education respondents were so uninterested? Um, I mean, part of that, you know, I, I was actually thinking into that. Um, I think maybe um, some students may feel that, oh, I need to take an endorsement in something or some kind of a concentration in order, because that's a graduation requirement to get some kind of an endorsement. Um, and that may be like their only option. So they may not feel like it's 100% for them. Um, so I mean, that could be some kind of a, a reason. Um, but as to that, I mean, it's still kind of puzzling to me. So yeah. Yeah, Michael. Was it students who are taking a language, or is it their feelings overall about language? Their feelings. These. Uh, that's a good clarification. Clarification question. Um, these students who participated in this uh, had either are taking a language or have prior experience in a language. So yeah. So it might also be helpful to look at mm -hmm. the Gen Ed requirement. Yeah. Require three up three levels mm -hmm. and LAS requires. Yeah, going one step further, that would be terrific. Yeah. How do you think the uh, analytical research that you did for this project um, prepared you for the, is going to prepare you for the jobs you apply? Yeah. And why do you, uh, why are you interested in this field? Terrific. I'm glad someone asked this question. Um, this is actually, this project is something that I use as a selling point to companies. And it's very rare to have an undergraduate program offer uh, research that is being, real research that's being conducted on campus. Um, so I have used this to market myself for companies um, for analytical positions, which is something that, uh, you know, I, I tell companies, oh, I took stat 100 back sophomore year of, of college and you know since then I've always been kind of drawn to uh, drawn to the statistical way of doing things and um, I mean just doing this kind of research it kind of reaffirms that for me so plus you know a little bit of our yes yes that always helps so yeah <laughs> yes <laughs> I'm gonna ask you the same question yeah is was there something about being an answer and doing mm -hmm. this research? Yeah, that, yeah. I, w I was actually thinking of, of something while you were asking that question. Um, it was a lot harder to actually collect the data than I had originally thought. Um, you know, for some reason, I, I just expected, oh, people are just going to be coming in and doing the survey, and it'll be so easy. Um, no, I actually had to go out there, get the numbers, and. I mean, I even spoke in uh, a few of my classes about, um, you know, uh, participation in this in this uh, survey. So, um, yeah, it was a lot more challenging than I would have, or than I originally had planned. But it was definitely a cool learning experience. So, yeah. <laughs> just just reflecting on that connection between the. Uh, research methods course on the capstone. Mm -hmm. I mean, I do think it's it's such a it's almost a luxury, and it's such a great luxury, you know, to be able to work with you guys over an extended period of time and really help you develop your ideas, and you know, think through a project. But even if that's not the project that you end up doing, which yours was the same, yeah, um, just that practice in articulating what your questions are in a researchable way, mm -hmm. sort of discerning whether you have. Uh, enough excitement about it to, yeah. to get through that hard slog of getting the, mm -hmm. the participants. Um, I just think it's uh, it's a unique part of apples, and I think it's really, really, really solid part uh -huh. of the nature. Can we quote you on that? <laughs> <laughs> All right, so I guess it's uh, our last uh, student is Kelly Fong, uh, uh, who uh, project's named Gesture and Word Learning. Uh, Kelly's been working on this for a while. She came to me with this idea and uh, brought in the research that, that, that motivated it. Uh, and we, uh, we worked to get uh, the, uh, the design down. And uh, it, was, it, was a, it was a nice uh, process all the way through. She collected a lot of data, uh, uh, recruited through our, uh, our lab. 
um, and uh, with Nayoung Kim helping out uh, with some of the sessions, making sure that we had the consent forms and all that kind of stuff. Uh, and um, as it turns out, uh, I think this summer we'll be, uh, well, after you're, you'll be back home, but we're still going to work uh, long distance on uh, we're going to get the paper published because the data came out very nicely. So um, uh, I think without further ado, I'll let you take it away. Thank you. Um, so I'm Kelly. So I, as you guys know, the title of my project is Gesture and Word Learning. So um, gestures have been found like to be beneficial in many learning areas like in math, language, reading. Oh, sorry. <laughs> and etc. in many researches. So like I think it was interesting that like and I wanted to explore more about like what kind of gesture use can be effective for language learning. And therefore me and uh, Dr. Christensen come up with the uh, research questions to gesture eight foreign language word learning. So um, my motivation of this project is came from uh, Kelly, McDevitt and Ash. 2009 study, and then uh, in their study, they found advantage for foreign language word learning when paired with some gestures. So um, they found that iconic gestures were better than low gestures and better than mismatched gestures, which they used gestures that match some other words in their sets. But like, um, I feel like matching with the misgesture in their set would be confused to the learners. So uh, I think like a uh, better comparison with arbitrary gesture that not obviously iconic with the gesture in the set. So like uh, that's why we designed this um, study. And then uh, our research method is we have 30 participants in the UIUC community and then they all have no previous experience with Chinese learning. So the experiments is uh, within subject design. And then the materials are, uh, we have like uh, created 18 Chinese words. They are all one syllables uh, for the words, so only one sound like, yeah. And then six uh, in each of the condition, which is the iconic gesture condition, arbitrary gesture condition, and then low gesture at all. And then the word order and the condition were counterbalanced or crossed the group, so there's three different groups uh, in the uh, experiments. The word were presented oral by me, and participants were asked to repeat the words twice after me. So for example, like in the con iconic condition, I will say like the first word is how, and then I gesture how means good, and then I will point at them. They have to repeat like how means good with the English. Uh, the uh, translation of the word. Then they were trained for two rounds for the whole set of the word. So, so what, what was the gesture with how? Yeah, this, yeah. like this. That's the iconic. And then the, like the mismatch uh, gesture would be like this. So like it would be mismatched with the meaning of the word. So like uh, they will have a two minute break after the first round of the presentation. And then there's a five minute break for the uh, second round of presentation, but like we uh, give out a uh, language background questionnaire for them as a uh, distractor. So after that, they will have a recall test at the end of all the words that were presented to them. And then for our data um, collection, we use the quantitative data collection method, and then we have the descriptive statistics statistic for the mean, and then we use the lo uh, legit mis model in the R to analyze the data. And then here's our finding, the, the result from uh, what we found, the accuracy of the Chinese word. So um, as you guys can see, like the P value is less than a 0 0.05. That means like, there is significance between. So uh, in the uh, graph, the significance between Iconic and low gesture is uh, significant, and then also the arbitrary, like the mismatch gesture compared to the uh, low gesture is also significant, but like the iconic and arbitrary, the mismatch condition is no big significance, so there are no significance.
and then also like for the trail of the other effect, it's in I think it's interesting because um, people got less accurate at this as the section progress in respective of the gesture condition. This could be due to the interference from the word that I introduced to them earlier. They have a lower accuracy at the word that I presented to them later. So people would think like usually people would get higher accuracy at the word that I presented to them like later. So they have a like newer memory of the words, but then this is like a uh, opposite side of the result. Like they got higher accuracy at the word that I presented to them earlier. So that's I think that's uh, interesting. And then the conclusion is uh, any gestures combined with Korean language or like second language word learning seem to a better record of the word. But like uh, not the confusing gestures like in the other paper that, com uh, that combine with the iconic gesture for the other way in the set that I introduced it to the learner because um, interference, like the misleading uh, curse. So uh, the usefulness of gesture is limited to the short section of the language we're learning only because like as you introduce more words to them, like they will be interfered the words even though the gesture doesn't keep that happening. And then, oops. Implication for educations is um, introducing lang second language. Word learning with gesture can increase the learning efficiency and then gesture aid in improving accuracy and later record. But like uh, we do not recommend like a uh, teacher to introduce too many words at all time because interference occurs as more words being taught. So lastly, uh, I want to thank uh, my mentor, Dr. Christensen, for providing support and uh, guidance to make this part of possible. And then I want to thank uh, Nayang. She's over there, a doctor <laughs> student. <laughs> she assists me in the data collecting process and help me with the data analyze. I'm very appreciative for both of them, their work and time and their patience for me. Thank you. And then thank you all for listening. <laughs>
uh, all right, like your gesture. They should be mentally imagining it. Right, exactly, yeah, exactly. yeah. yeah. mentally yeah. picturing it. Yeah. Yeah. You gave the example of how means good. Mm -hmm. Were there other words for, for which there is there's a Chinese, Chinese word, but there is an English word that sounds like that? And would that have made any, uh, any difference? Let me see, there's... I don't think because R of the word is only one syllable, so like, like um, drink means her, and then like, I don't think like there is word that like, you know. I didn't know if maybe the English association would help the the, the gesture recognition in one way or another. Well, say 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 how with the third tone. Say how. How. So. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I, like, <laughs> Was that third tone? How? Oh. Yeah. 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 So I already like, forget like what tone is. Yeah, right, yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> I think so, it, it sounds a little different. It's not like how. It's, it's a little how. Different. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So there's a tonal difference, but it, it it may be phonologically similar enough to. Yeah. But I don't think there were a lot of those. Did you notice any difference in the? So the sound of the good. Um, as a descriptor, did you have any nouns, verbs? I mean, you have oh, oh, yes, uh, but mostly are nouns, I think. I have like a couple words and like verb, and then. So did you find any any words that were that were predict that were particularly well remembered um, that might have been based on the category? Uh, no, I'm just wondering what else the data looked like. I didn't think about that before because like the list from my. Uh, uh, the word list is mostly a noun, and then like only like a couple of them were verb, and then like, and I think two of them were adjective too, like, but I didn't think about that when I designed the list. Well, it makes sense because nouns are easier probably to produce an iconic gesture for. Mm -hmm. I mean, good, and, I mean, we have, we have something that's, that's uh, a gesture that we use as a, actually, um, What's the word for that? We we don't. It's not a. It's not a spontaneous gesture that we would use. It's we have we have a meaning associated with this in our culture. Other gestures, um, like hat or something like that. I mean, or hat. I mean, you could gesture a hat, but it's it's not something that we would all necessarily agree. We would all come up with something different, but we all agree what you know what that is. Uh -huh. Um, I have one like that. I, I don't know like how people like differentiate the uh, gesture and the word, but like I have one is the house fang. I do this. So what do you think about this with the good? Is that like? Yeah, it's, it's, the house is a little bit less less standard, but most of them were pretty like drink was mm -hmm. you know pretty obvious drink and yeah, it's, most of them were pretty pretty straightforward and kind of. Uh, uh, Kind of routinized in mm -hmm. in English as well, but okay. not like, but they were very pretty good. Mm -hmm. Hard to come up with. I, I was wondering if you uh, <clears throat> modeled this study off of other studies that have mm -hmm. been done, similar studies, and if so, if there was anything different in your study compared to those studies. Um, as the one that I uh, mentioned in my uh, slides. The Kelly McDivitt and Ash 2009. Mm -hmm. uh, their study, like, they also found like iconic gestures, like, would help uh, with uh, for regional language learning. But like, but then like the only different part is like they use the mismatch gesture with other words that in their in their set of study. So I think like using arbitrary that are not like associated with the anywhere in their list, that would be like more effective to see like if there's difference between so Thank you. and did that that Kelly study they didn't they didn't check uh, order effects did they? No. they they didn't do any analysis no, they didn't like that. do any of that. Oh, one more question on the order effect thank you um, did you did you were you able to look at whether the interference effect depended on the condition no 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 like in respect of uh, the condition you can make an argument that they're more distinctive gestures rather than mm -hmm. the themselves. It would reduce command. Maybe with more more items, like that might come out. Yeah. Yeah, but I think it'd be interesting to think about imageability and this question of gesture ability and imageability, and yeah. maybe 
Yeah. There are those word lists of mm -hmm. highly imageable words, and maybe maybe run it with only highly imageable words, mm -hmm. and then they're then you're sort of controlling for that mm -hmm. that variant variability. Okay. Yeah. And then. No. Oh, did I cut off somebody? Okay. <laughs> no, go, go ahead. This is just a small question. But, um, so what were the people that didn't do gestures doing during that period? I mean, like, uh... So was the, was the presentation <laughs> rate the same? Was the, <laughs> was the, was the, so I guess I'm wondering if the, if the presentation rate was faster for the people that didn't have gestures. That's just such an interesting thing. And uh, now, like all of the participants, they are uh, presented with their like uh, no gesture, I can I can gesture and arbitrary, but like six words in each of the conditions. So like there's no uh, like uh, the so it's all within subjects. yes within right. subjects. So did you make sure to control the length of the presentation, the d the time between the trials? Um, actually, I didn't do the time control, but like. Like the present, yeah. But so the so the, so the so the people that didn't gesture had a faster presentation rate. No, I think the presentation rate is like the same all across all groups and all presentation. Like I just like presented with the gestures, and there's no difference between like the rate. So the people that weren't gesturing, what were they doing during that time? Were they just sitting on the? She, she gestured. You gestured. Yeah. The I subjects did not. And they did. Because they got the same input, but not the act. I got it. OK. Thank you. And then we have a question. OK, I have my same question I've asked the other two. Is there, was there something in doing this project with, with Kyle Christensen that did it surprise you? Having nothing to do with it. Did the research, doing the research, did it surprise you? Uh, I think in the uh, um, data collecting process, I found like surprise is that like the gender population, like m majority of them like are females, and then like I didn't get like any like uh, uh, males oh, participants like right. until like the very end, but, like, <laughs> and then. You had gender. Yeah, Michelle probably knows. Also, like I found, like couple of the participants, they were doing like really good job on the test. Like, I think two or three of them only got one of the item wrong. All of them like correct. Yeah. <laughs> Any questions? <laughs>